Hi, welcome to Electrovox. We're here at Zero Day Festival and I'm once again joined by the wonderful Jamie of ESA, Electronic Substance Abuse. Hi. Hello. Hello, thank you again for joining me. I no think problem. you're probably one of the first video interviews I did. It's been a long time since then. Yeah, I remember that. Long. You were quite surprised with some of the things I had to say. So. <laughs> yeah, let's, uh, let's keep the surprises to a minimum today. Yeah, to this <laughs> All right, so we spoke a little bit at Resistance Festival and you had quite a short set. Having, was it 12 albums you have now? 12 years at 10 of them at least highly critically acclaimed. How the hell do you come up with a process of squeezing all of that into the space of 45 or an hour long set? Yeah, it's really difficult, especially if you have released something new in like the past six months and you want to kind of like push a lot of the tracks on there. And if, uh, you know, critics have responded very well to tracks on there, um, you obviously want to try and include as much of that material. But then you are also wanting to make sure that you have kind of like the crowd pleasers and the tracks that people kind of uh, predict to hear and, you know, to get excited about. So it is tough. Ultimately, I will look at a set and I might have 20 tracks in there. And that will range from probably album five onwards because the production got so much better for me personally. And it's much better to play better produced music than you know, stuff that's been, hasn't been kind of remixed or anything to sound better. Yeah. So the, the strength of the tracks might be there, but I would prefer to play stuff that sounds as good as it can possibly be. So I might have 20 tracks from, say, album five upwards. And then I'll look at those 20 tracks. I'll decide which ones do I love playing the most? Which ones give me the pleasure? Because if I am getting pleasure from playing tracks, then it kind of bleeds through into the performance. And I think the crowd can see it. They can see a bored artist on stage. They can see somebody who's played the same track over and over again. Definitely. Um, so I will, I will take like a reasonably forensic view of what the best stuff is to do and then I'll go, okay, I love that, I love that, I love that. And obviously as you release more and more stuff, um, the, the new stuff you'll enjoy playing more because, you know, it's new for you and you're kind of figuring it out and it's, there's a bit of excitement to that. And without that kind of, um, like possibility of mistake, it, it kind of takes the energy out a little bit. Mm. Like one of the performances I had in America recently, the, all my equipment just imploded. So I'm on the stage trying to figure out what mid, mid set, how to fix it all. And after it was fixed, I had this huge burst of, you know, adrenaline yeah. because, you know, I managed to get through this chaos. And then I was like, fuck it, the set's gone. What do you want to hear? And I was asking people, and this was in a, a Salt Lake City, asking, well, you know, what tracks do you want to hear? Because they've never seen me in the city before, probably never will again the likelihood, right? So yeah. I think it's good to have a little bit of um, energy yeah. and possible chaos. Yeah, I mean, there's something really different with you actually, I've noticed on stage because, you know, I've seen plenty of industrial bands who just stand behind their laptop. I've seen plenty of industrial bands who jump around the stage because they've got guitarists, drummers, you name it. Obviously being on the stage by yourself, you still have the, obviously the electric drumming and stuff, but there's always a difference between an artist who's really trying to throw themselves around on stage because they feel like they have to, and one who's throwing themselves around on stage because they're having a fucking great time. Mm -hmm. And I can tell that you were doing that, essentially. Um, I mean, with the isolation set that you put together um, for not just Electrovox during lockdown, but for some other places too, like the amount of passion and energy you had in that, even though you didn't even have an audience, mm -hmm. you could tell that this was like, this was what you are passion about rather than just what you feel like you have to do. So is that always the case with every show you play, just putting that much emotion into it and whatever happens, it happens? So it's real primitive and I'm going to disappoint you now. Yeah. If, if, if the sound is loud enough, yeah. I will get carried away. And if I've written it, it's because I love it, right? I would, if anything is not working for me, I'll just put it in the trash. So the tracks that I put together, I'm proud of, mm. you know, not in an egotistical way, but I'm like, you know, I'm proud that I managed to get this result out of a track. I managed to, you know, create some different elements and something. So if I hear that really loud and I get to press something and it makes a noise yeah. and it makes a big boom. Dopamine. Like so it, it's my dopamine, yeah. yeah. And the louder it is on stage, the better. And I know people use in-ears, I don't. I'm, I'm a, a very primitive monkey and I like to, you know, 
hear it being blasted at me. No good for the hearing as I've found out, but... Yeah, you know. so one of the questions was going to be, um, having had hearing issues, you still, whilst having hearing issues, put out two of the best industrial albums ever made. How have you managed to adapt your hearing issues with making music now? So I recognise the compliment, thank you very much. I acknowledge that, thank you. Um, so the hearing loss was down to uh, an inner ear infection that happened at the beginning of COVID, so I couldn't get seen. And that inner ear infection took its toll. And when we finally figured it out with the surgeons what needed to happen, we got it done. It had done a fair bit of damage. But during that whole experience, um, what we found in trying to diagnose the problem here is that the other ear, um, I have no low end at all. I've never known that. Something probably from birth or it's just happened very gradually. So you weren't aware then? So I wasn't aware. So I've been mixing with no low end in my left ear for 20 years. So right now, the, the lasting effect is in my right ear. I have, I have a decrease of high end, which means, you know, I'm not hearing certain instruments above a certain frequency in this ear and I'm hearing no low end at all with this. So. You, you suggested that I'd mixed when it was at its worst. Uh, I, it wasn't. It's, it's now much better, but the loss is still there. Um, I have constant tinnitus, just like every other musician, yeah. um, and probably every party goer as well. Um, so you, you adapt. You, you, your synapses adapt to that shit. You, um, you know, you make up for it in some way. And, and I'm, I'm not saying the mix perfectly because, you know, I will send it off to someone who'll say, you know, it's way too much low end because I'm not hearing it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so someone will, with someone with very balanced hearing, with a critical view, who's not afraid to tell me that it's rubbish, will tell me that and I'll go back and I'll recheck it. But ultimately, yes, it's made an impairment, but you just get around it. Like anybody with any, any small disability, it's not a huge disability. It could be much worse and I expect it to get worse. And I've kind of reconciled with that, that, you know, you know, 42, that's what I am now. It's, as we get along, it's going to get worse and worse. That's why I'm probably subconsciously pumping out as much as I can while I still, still yeah. can without sounding too, no, no, you know. Makes sense. And it's quite surprising actually, because one of the things that sticks out about your music to me is when I listen to it on headphones, it has that sort of ability to go from one ear to the other. You're not just listening to a song. If you don't have a one headband, one headphone, you're not going to hear a good third of the song. You know, so you need both in. So it's quite interesting that you know you suffer from one side compared to the other. But it sounds like your music's been specifically designed to take advantage of both ears. So it's quite interesting. So I, I learned about the, the kind of the importance of nuance in music. I mean, if it's just a pop track, if you are throwing out a three minute chorus and verse, you don't need it. But if you're trying to like build a, a journey in a track, um, it's nice to add those little nuances the, the panning, you know, I'm going to give you a squeak in this ear and a, a bark in that ear and it's going to like mess you up a little bit. It does. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's, that's the enjoyment of being a, a bit of a, a master of puppets with your music. You get to do exactly what you want. The record label is not saying you need to write more like this or like yeah. this. It's free reign and with that, I probably do, you know, take advantage of the fact that I can fuck with it and make tracks go in a direction you're not expecting it kind of thing. Yeah, and that's why it's done so well, right? Because if Hopefully. the artist gets to do what they want to do, they actually make good music. <laughs> Yeah, that that should be the way it is. It yeah, yeah. Now, I see you've you've been doing this. You've been doing ESA since what two thousand eight? Is it a while? Now? I think probably my first show was about two thousand eight. Yeah. 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 So, has your music changed as you've developed in your life? Um, so, as you grow as a person, has your music changed? Or with ESA being such an important thing towards your identity? Have you changed alongside the music? Which, which one's changed who? It's a really good question. Mm. Um, it's a difficult one to answer actually because it kind of just happens without you knowing it. Mm. Um, I think if we're just talking from a musical point of view, obviously I started off in, you know, doing metal before you say, and then I moved into power noise and I was like, you know, I want to make this destructive corroded noise with a beat in it. And the whole purpose of it was just to like blast people at a show 
Um, and as time's gone on, I've gone, you know what, let's be a bit more daring. Let's kind of do more what's kind of at the back of your head and you want to like make, make a little adventure out of it. The question, which changes first, I, I'm, I'm going to really struggle to answer that. I think I've, had, I've felt more liberated as I've gone along. Um, good feedback always makes you feel like maybe this is the right direction. I'm not saying bad feedback would make me not go in that direction, but um, as a person, I mean, as you get older, you know, your priorities change, your, um, the way you approach things changes. Not, maybe, maybe just feeling freer if we're talking about the music, you know, just feeling, okay, I have, I have free reign and, you know, this is, this is up to me kind of thing. Yeah. Because from an outside perspective, I mean, I've been following your music for quite a while now. I think you're probably one of the first artists I saw live that made me go, ah, oh, Kindas really is for me. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember trying to listen to your original works and there were songs in there that made me go, oh, well, things like, you know, Say No To Even, which so when we were all younger, it was easy, okay. to, easy to make fun of. Yes. Yeah. And then the visuals that you had at the time when I was watching you live, um, there was sort of like some murder and some sort of dark, scenery going on a little bit. So yeah, the visuals were dark, there was some sort of you know, like murder and all that sort of stuff in it. And I do remember speaking to you about them and you were sort of quite shocked that an audience member next to me had sort of not oh, appreciated yeah. that yeah, too much. Yeah. Um, but since then, like the music videos you put out um, have been absolutely stellar phenomenon. Like there's only two industrial bands out there that can make music videos make your jaw drop with the story and what you're seeing and that is of course yourself and Ramstein. Hmm. you know so it's, it's a big comparison well yeah but i mean even when it comes down to the basics so like it resistance your visuals you had uh, the new track come find me come on and you had sort of the old 1930s 1940s walks in going on so how is it that you've gone from sort of this impressive industrial artist to this incredible media mogul who's now able to turn any music and any sort of video into gold dust, essentially. Where did all of that come from? So I think uh, when I was younger, writing the music, I think I was very naive. Um, I don't think I really had like a panache for nuance yet. I didn't really feel like I had the ability to make something impressive, so I probably just went for the easiest thing, right? And then, through working with Miles, who's my best friend in Yorkshire, he started, you know, doing videography for a living. Um, and we kind of just fooled around together, you know, making things, and we're like, okay, let's take it to the next level. Let's try and actually make a music video. Can't be that hard. It turns out it isn't. It isn't that hard. If you've got the equipment, if you've got a couple of people that are sharing the same vision and have reasonably the same tastes, well, Miles is not particularly a horror fan or a fan of the music, but he's a film fan. Mm. And I'm a huge film fan. And, you know, we kind of just came together and then progressively the production value went up and up. You know, you learn more on every set, you learn more. I say set, you know, someone's bathroom or something, you know. But you just learn more and you, you you look at a video and go, okay, this works, this works really well. I really like it, it's my favorite section. So you do more of that. Yeah. And I just think for me, doing music videos became almost more important than the music because I was getting to satisfy my ambition. Mm. Like I can do this, it's like a challenge. So I think the two are now are kind of like on the same, you know, yeah. swimming together kind of thing. Yeah. I mean. From the great videos you had for things like Eat Their Young with Caitlin Collins right. to then Burial 10, and then they were already stellar, but then with the most recent one, One Miss Call, that's that's an entire movie into itself almost, with a lot of the inspiration from previous horror films. Um, so is this kind of satisfying your your loves and your desires, and that's what makes the direction and the music so good, because it's you know, it's getting to do what you love. Is that essentially why that's brought you to the level you are now? Yes. If it was, if I was being asked to do a certain type of music that doesn't have any love from me, 
or do music videos that um, you know were following a different tact, mm. they'd be decent quality because I'm an anal perfectionist, just like a lot of producers. But it wouldn't probably have the the impact because there's no no real love in it. Mm. But I think you know I, I see so many films and. My, my favorite genre is like dark psychological. It's not actually horror, but it's very hard to make a music video that has a nuance of a dark psychological drama, right? In such a short time. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, so you have to kind of go for horror because you have more things to play with in four minutes. So like, you know, make big scenes. Something like a dark psychological drama is far more like sedate and the, the, the trauma is behind what's going on. It's metaphorical most of the time. So yeah, I, I'd see it as a as an opportunity to kind of you know vent the, the love for those kind of films. Yeah, and I mean mess with people's minds a bit too, I suppose, because you know everyone has heard of Wilhelm Scream, right? But so so uh, Wilhelm Scream, you know, the, when someone's falling and trying to. All right. <laughs> everyone kind of knows that if you heard it, you know. But All right. the thing you did on the telephone where she's screaming, "I hate you," and it just lengthens out that note of scream. Don't know what that is, but that just psychologically kicks not just me in the head, but quite a lot of people I've spoken to about that particular moment. So okay. it's like you're also psychologically in the music being a thriller as well, essentially, <laughs> rather than just a video. So. so that means a lot. I like that. That's, that's definitely something I'm probably subconsciously, uh, probably consciously going for as well. But the, the sample you're referring to, that was uh, my press manager, or was my press manager for the record label, Constantina Bahalis. I said, so I've got an idea. Let's, um, let's have you record uh, an answering mas machine message to yourself. So, you know, try and think about everything that you hate about yourself and leave a message for yourself. I was like, obviously this is pretty dank shit, but you know, in the, the pursuit of a, of a really like fearsome sample, let's, mm -hmm. let's try and make this into the track. So we did that way before the idea for the music video. And I spoke to Constantina about, you know, how do we fit this sample into a story? And then we talked about it at length and she gave me a lot of ideas that ended up coming into one missed call. But yeah, it's um, when you, I mean, essentially ESA is dance music, right? It's, it's constructed like that, but a bit more of an adventure going on. So for something like one missed call, I'm like, okay, let's, let's make an absolute banger. How do you do that? The breakdown's got to be massive. When it comes in, it's got to be huge. You gotta use these little psychological audio tricks to make you feel the anxiety as it's pumping up. And that's what a, a lot of really good techno and you know dance producers do. They, they learn the, the nuances of like fading out one instrument, bring in another, take off the low frequency, throw it in, throw a sample, well-placed, connect it to the song, and then it'll like, go into beast mode, right? And that's where one goes crazy. And that's probably what I did for one Miss call. It was like, let's make this big song and i mean coming full circle there a bit i mean you said previously you didn't feel like you were good enough to make sort of incredible music when you were younger and now you're getting to that point where you know you are capable of it and you are doing it um if you don't mind me saying so i've noticed sort of hints of an imposter syndrome in so i remember in our original interview when i gave you a compliment it was really hard to take it and now you've just said, you know, I can I can now recognise a compliment and hear one, which you never used to be able to do, so well done to you. <laughs> but also I've noticed little bits and pieces like on stage where you might have a momentary screw up, which I don't think anyone would ever notice. I think I watched the isolation set about seven times. It was only on the seventh time that I noticed you did a tiny one or two second mess up in your face. It was a micro expression of like, fuck. But I yeah. could tell, yeah. and like I could tell that it bothered you for the rest of the song about how much of a perfectionist you are. So yeah, um, it wasn't really a question there. I'm just saying, you know, we can appreciate how much perfectionism you're trying to put into this. So just fucking well done. Man. I appreciate that, dude. Thank you. No artist seems to care as much as you do. So essentially, don't be so hard on yourself. <laughs> so I, I am going to answer it as if it's a question. Yeah. So that's okay. So. I, I, I str you say I'm a media mogul, mm. definitely not because I hate media. I just know how to do certain things, I'm creative. But I, I have a real like, cr 
cringe when I see kind of people screaming into the void about how great what they do is. Mm. Whether that's on social media or elsewhere. It's like um, trying to convince everybody how busy, how good they are, how amazing what they're producing is. And I don't know if it's just the Yorkshire in me, but I have a cringe that goes on that's like, I think it's a European thing where you just kind of like, you know? <laughs> so when I fuck up, yeah, it does affect me because I'm like, I want to give you perfection. I want to, I want, you've come out here, I want to give you perfection. And if I th fuck something up, that's taken away from your experience. And yeah, instantaneously I'll be like, fuck. That's the thing that we don't notice at all. <laughs> it might be one, one skipped beat that no one's going to notice in an hour on set. I think you'll find there are a lot of musicians like that, you know. I think, I, I think when you mention imposter syndrome, it's so much more common than you realise. Mm -hmm. And even when you were talking about those people that are like screaming into the void of, you know, yeah, this is what I do and, you know, give me thousands of likes online. I think even those people feel that imposter syndrome a lot of the time. And I think it's just a human trait that's very difficult to remove because, you know, if you really want something to be great, you know, until you've been fully validated, then you're not sure it is. And when does that full validation come? Who gives you that? Like, it has to come from you and... Do you, do you know what I mean? We go yeah, full circle. Yeah. If you can't listen to yourself, you aren't going to really listen to many other people. Either. But I think that imposter syndrome sometimes helps. It pushes you. Mm. It, it makes you be better and try and create something different and interesting and smart. You've also worked with a lot of really good artists. So, Caitlin Kralix, like I've mentioned. What's the most important thing for you when deciding on who to collaborate with in the projects? So I'm kind of at the stage now where, like, I don't think it's a big secret. I'm, you know, steadily working towards the wind down. Like, I don't want to do this forever. Um, so for me, when I talk to an artist about a collaboration, it's really more of, you know, how much fun is this going to be? Like, how much... How much are we going to be able to work together to create something? How much do we connect? How much are we on the same level? Um, so it's, for me, it's really about how much fun the experience is going to be. Maybe it's not for the other person, maybe for the other person there's something else. You know, there's a different reason. But I wouldn't say that I'm at the stage now where I would make a decision to work with somebody you know, for kind of like uh, financial reasons or like seeing credit or anything like that. I'd much rather work with somebody who's maybe less known than somebody else if I know that we're like super passionate about it. Mm. Give them a hand up, so to speak. Maybe. I don't like, yeah, I feel weird to say, that would be weird to say, I think. Like, I don't think I would ever see myself as somebody that is able to give a hand up, but if, if the result is, the, is that, then that's cool. Well, I mean, I would say being one of the most successful industrial artists, you put your name behind someone, it's, it's going to build them up. <laughs> Whether you see it that way or not, it, mm, it's, it's okay. going to. Okay, thank you. thank you. Now, um, you've mentioned there's on the bit of the wind down for ESA now, but do you feel with Designer Carnage and Burial 10, you sort of hit your peak evolution for ESA? Or do you feel there's still a bit of evolution to come? Have you found your signature sound now, do you feel? So because I've never, I've, I've always consciously tried to never write the same track twice. And I think I've managed that to a reasonable level. I don't think there are two tracks that you would listen to side by side and go, you know, they, look, they sound exactly the same. So when we talk about a signature sound, the signature elements of what I do, but I don't know if I have a signature sound because I'm always trying to create something different. Designer Carriage was what well, is something I'm extremely proud of because it moves into some different areas all the way through the record. If I have the ability to do that again, I'm not sure, like when do I run out of steam and ideas? I think the world is a different place as well. I think albums have got a shelf life. I think if you want to do an album, it's got to be for you really, like a positive experience for you. And if you have the time and the love and the ability to do it. 
So if I continue to release new material, it will probably be in the form of more bite-sized products like singles or EPs. Yeah, that's fine. And when I do that, it's, there's got to be a reason behind it. Like, what does this add to what I've already done? Or is this just, you know, just pump, pump, pumping something out there for the sake of it? I, I don't want to do that. Okay. And just last couple of questions. Do you feel like there was one particular album? I mean, we've always had some great albums, like Carmel Lust albums were great. Do you feel there was a particular album, potentially things like That Beast, where there was a turning point where you were like, okay, ESA is doing really well and I'm going to keep doing it. This is cool with my doubts to men. That's a good question. There's been two turning points. When I put out How Pure Would Your Utopia Be, that felt like a shift up, like change gears. And I was like, all right, okay, this, I can do this. Um, and again, That Beast, That Beast, wasn't something internal. I was like suddenly getting people recognizing me. Like if you go to a festival and you're walking around the street, people are like, you're that beast, <laughs> right? <laughs> Literally. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And then people would be, oh, I like that album, The Beast. But I was like, okay, fine. But that album, it, it did stratosphere me, take me to a different stratosphere. Yeah. Um, the albums before that had been received well, I don't know what it is about that beast. I don't know if it's because it had the first music video, second one, sorry. First one was The Hold. Um, but and I don't know if I sat down and thought, okay, I'm going to write this kind of album. I don't think I did that. There was no real strategy. Just like, let's make a kick-ass album. No longer a concept album, though. Mm. And it just got received really well. And I was like, okay, okay, maybe, maybe I should continue and, you know, keep pushing and the feedback's been great and okay, maybe I deserve it and maybe I've got there kind of thing. And then obviously Barrel 10, I was very um, ambitious with that. Like record label, I want to get an eight panel CD for this one and all this kind of thing, you know, I thought, you know, I'm moving up here. Yeah. And then Designer Carnage, I'm not saying I've, I've got as many followers or listeners as I'm ever going to get, but I was like, okay, I'm now at the level where I can go do whatever I want. Yeah, because Designer Carnage did better than everything you've done previously, didn't it? Designer Carnage in the first day sold as many as that beast had sold up to that point, which is three years. In one day, it was just like, I thought the record label was lying. I thought they were just trying to, <laughs> you know, play some cool American joke on me. And I was like, no, th there it is. There's the, there's the sales. I don't know, I think that was down to the, the really cheeky camp, uh, marketing campaign that I did for it, probably. I mean, I don't know. it was a, a good, little in, good little indication of how things were going to be with all the little hints. Mm. And all of the little pretend items that people could buy, that was a good little... Yeah, it was just me, I kind of, kind of poking fun at, um, <laughs> just, just what I was talking about, the, the, uh, the fakery of the, um, the social media world and the, the marketing campaigns that companies use and it's none of it's real. <laughs> yeah, it's all, it's all <laughs> yeah. It's nice to see it in common. Yeah. All right, and then pretty much lastly, so we're here at the 35th birthday for Slime Nights and of course with the way the world and other things are going. How important is this venue to you and how important do you think it is to the scene and what would you like people to hear about it? So I played my first show in, at Slime Light when I was probably about 30, 32. And it was probably the worst show of my life. Like every, everything corrupted. Um, I have a lot of sound problems. Um, I'll never forget that. And it, but the venue, whenever I come back here, I get a real feeling of welcome home, right? Like family's here again. You know, I know every, all the staff, first names, you know, there's always a bit of kind of um, you know, piss taken or whatever, you. back again, you know. Yeah. Um, so I have a lot of love for the venue. Um, I think it's incredibly important. I don't know what direction the venue is going to go in. I understand the politics and things have changed. But um, as a venue in the walls and the floors and the the dirty, scrappy curtains and the stains everywhere. I love all of those. 
but I love the, the staff here. I just hope it, I hope it continues because we've seen a massive change in the way it looks and feels over the last 10 years, right? It's like now a, a very attractive venue, right? But 10 years ago, it was, I don't want to pick the wrong words, but it was much more spit and sawdust, I guess. So it's nice to see the evolution. I just hope that it continues being a home for the weirdos, the alternatives, the people who don't feel quite right anywhere else. I think that's very important for any city and any culture. To respect where we came from. Right? Absolutely. Okay, cool. And lastly, Jerry, anything to say to your fans? Um, just keep going. <laughs> it's been a shitty couple of years, but just keep going. Thank you very much for your time again. Thank right. you for watching. Thank you.